Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Age Better, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and yep, age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. A few weeks ago, I read a terrific article written by Richard Eisenberg, who's my guest on the show today. In it, he talked a bit about the different paths that people tend to take when they retire. Some go on to other jobs, even starting a company. Many find ways to serve by doing volunteer work. And yet others decide to take the self-improvement route and go back to school. In his article, Richard wrote about one school in particular that I found pretty fascinating. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Here's a little background info about Richard. He's a distinguished journalist who has spent a significant part of his career focusing on work and finances specifically for the over 50 crowd. He's held senior editorial positions at Money Magazine and Next Avenue, and now writes articles for many different publications, including Market Watch, which is where I saw the article. Definitely check out the link to the article and to some other things that Richard has written in the show notes. Whether you're thinking about retiring, already retired, or even just a little curious about this stage of life, this episode is definitely for you. So you know what to do. Pop in your earbuds, maybe sit down or take a little walk while you're listening and enjoy this episode. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by Smart Water Alkaline. Whether you're running miles or running meetings, elevate how you hydrate with Smart Water Alkaline. It's the hydration that fits perfectly into an active lifestyle and your backpack or hand. It's simple. Rise, grind, alkaline. Elevate how you hydrate and pick up a Smart Water Alkaline today. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Age Better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. Today, my guest is Richard Eisenberg. He's written several notes. He focuses on the 50 plus demo. He has had some very senior positions, editorial positions at Money Magazine and Next Avenue. And he has a podcast. There'll be links to all of this in the show notes. But he also calls himself an unretired journalist, which I really, really, really love. Welcome to Age Better, Richard. Thank you, Barbara. It's great to be here. So I was really intrigued by your article that I caught. I mean, I've been following you for years, so I see just about everything that you write and put out there. But I saw this article in Market Watch, and it was about a reinvention program that was really very intriguing. And you compared it, you were very intrigued by it as well. You compared it to other reinvention programs, kind of more traditional ones. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted everyone listening into this, people who are thinking about retiring or are retired, and they can start to think about, well, what will their next chapter look like? And this is definitely an option. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this program? It's the SOAR SOAR program. SOAR is a really interesting new program from Claremont Graduate University outside of Los Angeles, uh, starting up this spring for the first time. And it's to help people, as you say, kind of figure out the next chapter of their lives. And what I found interesting about it was that unlike some other programs that are excellent, the other ones that I've seen, many of them are very, very, very expensive. And I mean, $60,000, $70,000. And, and, you know, there's some people who can afford that, not that many, but some who can, and I'm happy that they can. And aren't those, Richard, really geared more toward, you know, a C-suite level, possibly very senior management people who really do have the funds yeah. and they can, they just want to kind of think about maybe starting their not-for-profit or, am I right about that? That's typically true. You know, Stanford has one, Harvard has one, Notre Dame has one, yeah. University of Texas, although they don't necessarily build themselves as being for senior executives, but I think you're right. Those are the kinds of people who can most likely afford it and, and might be interested. The SOAR program is like one, a few others I've seen. There's one that the University of Colorado, Denver has. They are much less expensive. I mean, we're talking about under $5,000. They are shorter in duration. They're not a whole year. They're usually a few months long and they're on or off. So they're 
virtual for a few weeks, they're in person for a few days. And so I feel like for a lot of people who are in their 50s and 60s, they're more manageable, both financially and every other way. And and I like the way that the Claremont program was trying to pull together the business side people that they work with and the psychology people and the philosophy people and put it all together in a program. Because I think when you're trying to figure out this stage of life, there are a lot of components to think about. And it's not all about the money and it's not all about my identity, but those are certainly parts of it. But there's lots of other things too. Yeah. I mean, it really is uh, helping people from what I read in your article, helping people kind of think about what their next step is going to be and to give them more tools and more holistic too, as you just pointed out. But why would somebody want to do this program? What can people really expect to gain? You know, it's relatively inexpensive compared to the other programs, but it's still an expense and it's a time commitment as well. So what do they really expect to get out of it? Some clarity? I think so. A lot of people know what they're retiring from. They know what they have done all their careers. They're ready to stop doing that, but they don't necessarily know what they want to do next. They don't know what they want to retire to. And so programs like this can help them figure that out. They may not give them the answer, but they'll help them figure out what the questions are to ask themselves. And really, what I think is really one of the big pluses is you'll get to be with other people like you who are also going through the same experiences and challenged with it and hear from each other. Well, I'm thinking about that, or I tried that, or I'm nervous about that. And you'll see you're not alone. And you'll see what other people have tried and what you might want to think about doing. And you'll give them some of your ideas. So you'll learn from the teachers, but you'll learn from the students too. Yeah. And it sounds also like you did mention that it's hybrid. So you can be virtual or you can be in person. Is it well, required? It is, but so it's like a bit of a requirement. Yeah. And you did mention this particular program is that outside of LA, outside of Los Angeles. Right. So you have to be in that area. Are there at this time other programs like this one? Or is this really unique and kind of like a test to see how they can roll it out and maybe other universities, colleges can adopt the model or? Well, so the programs that places like uh, Stanford and Harvard are on campus that are not virtual. Right. And so you have to find, you need to pay for a place to live. And they're usually about a year long. There are a few other programs that are like this where you only need to be on campus for a few days. And a lot of it is virtual. So there is an expense. You don't have to be in or from Los Angeles. You do, you do have to come to Los Angeles for a few days, right. but then most of the time you're doing it from your home or wherever you happen to be taking your Zoom classes from. So, but they like to have people on campus for a couple of days, partly to just have everybody together in one room and also to sort of ex have the Claremont graduate experience. But they also realize that people have busy lives and they can't relocate for a long period of time in many cases. So they wanted to do a mixture of the two. And, and you know, they've never done it before, so they're going to see how it works out. They've done a lot of focus group, a lot of test marketing before this to find out what people might want. But I think they've said to me that they're going to find out after the first cohort goes through it, you know, is this the best way to do it? And should we do more days in person or fewer? Should we do more virtual or fewer or keep it the same? And so, you know, I'm curious to see how it goes for them. Yeah. And it's really a smallish group, isn't it? Like 25, 30 yeah. people. I mean, it's not a... That's right. And that's typical for many of these programs. Are, I'd say anywhere between, say, 12 and, and 40 people. You don't want it to be so large that you sort of you lose yourself in it and there are too many other students, but you don't want it to be just you and one other person either. So I think I think that financially it just makes sense for everybody for it to be on the small side. It's personal that way. Sure. But enough people that you can gain from the other students too, I think. And it really makes sense, too, to have it be hybrid because that really is a reflection of how so many businesses now operate. I'm thinking of my own two daughters. Both of them are one more so than the other. One is in the office more. The other one is more virtual. <laughs> but, you know, right. hybrid right. does seem to be what's working. And I think what a lot of people have gotten quite used to in recent years, 
your article does touch on transitions as part of the SOAR curriculum, the program. And what are some of the, because um, you focus on this demo, that's what you do. What are some of the challenges, the most common challenges that people kind of working their way to retirement or maybe they are retired? What do they really confront mostly that this program tries to address? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it is trying to find meaning and purpose at this stage of life, because for a lot of people, either they haven't thought about that before, or they got meaning from their work, and now they don't have that job anymore. And so some people get a little bit lost, and sometimes there's a loss of identity. So I think a program like this is designed to kind of help you find your meaning and purpose in life and what you want to do with yourself. Some people get very depressed and lonely and isolated um, when they're in this stage of life because they're so used to being around a lot of people and now they're not. These programs, because you're with other people, whether it's virtually or in person, you're at least with a group of people for a given amount of time, you know, either one day a week or a few days in a row. So you're not by yourself all the time. I think those are the main challenges. Mostly I'd say it's about figuring out how do you want to spend your time What's going to excite you? What's going to make you want to get up in the morning? There's a Japanese word that I've written about that I love called ikigai. Yes, you yes. Probably, uh, I love it. Too. I love that you yeah. wrote about it and you referenced it and say it again, because I think I just talked right over you. That, say it again. Okay. <laughs> well, it's called ikigai, and forgive my pronunciation, but I'll spell it. It's I-K-A-G-A-I. It's a Japanese word that loosely translated means the reason to get up in the morning. And I think that's what a lot of people in this chapter are struggling with, but need to find. And once they do find it, it makes all the difference. And it doesn't have to be one thing. And it may also be something that changes over time. But for a lot of people, they say, well, I want to get motivated in this way. It, to, I want to help other people. I want to help myself. I'd like to bring in some money. And so they find their ikigai through a, a bunch of different ways. I know that's what I've been doing, and, and I find it really fulfilling. But I know that people who don't have that and kind of just get lost. stay on their sofa all day, yeah, and they watch television, they they get depressed, they don't know what to do with themselves, and that's bad for them. It's bad for their loved ones, too. Absolutely. And there was a, a wonderful book that was written about, it, 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 please, you pronounce it that because I will mess it up. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. A lovely, lovely book. And I will actually include a link to that book as okay. well in the in the show notes. And you're so right about that. I mean, it isn't always about making money, but for some people, of course, it will be, absolutely. And you know, whatever brings you uh whatever your jam is, right? Whatever brings you happiness. But also if you yeah. follow the blue zones, as I'm sure you do, and I know I do as well. That is a big part of it. We know that there's a huge part of why some people age successfully or more successfully than others. You need to have, you know, what is your why? What is your purpose? And it's so, so incredibly important. I always like to hold myself up as an example. I know you do too. For me, this is my third career. I had a very successful career in magazine publishing. Then I moved over to the international conference business and, you know, running a company, really happy doing both of those things. And then I hit 50 and I had to, didn't have to reinvent myself, but I, I went through menopause and just had a whole kind of outer body experience of like, what mm -hmm. is happening here? Mm -hmm. And then wrote my first book. And then for me, the rest is is history. So for 17 years, I've been in this world of, of you know, positive aging. So I get that. And that is my purpose. That is my purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's important, I think, for everyone to find their purpose too. And it's great that these programs are doing that. And I really hope that others roll out around the country to make them even more accessible than this one. But what do they look for? I mean, obviously you have to apply. You have to apply like you're going to any college, right? So you do have to apply. I, I wouldn't say it's quite as rigorous as trying to get into the most selective universities in the world, <laughs> but they, they want to be sure that you're serious about it and that your goals align with their goals. So there's usually an essay and an application form and they usually have an interview where they want to just, you know, find out why are you applying? What do you want to get out of it? and make sure that it's a good match. And often it is, but every now and then it might not be. And 
they don't want to turn people down, but they also don't want people to come and then be disappointed either. Right. And that makes total sense completely. Okay, let's broaden our focus for one minute. From your perspective as a journalist specializing in work and finance primarily, I mean, that really is your, your kind of your main focus and specific yeah. to people who are a retirement age or midlife 50 and over. So what are some of the emerging trends that you're seeing in retirement planning that you may want to share with us? Well, I think the one that I'm most excited about, but I'd like to see more of it is when financial advisors work together with retirement coaches or life coaches with their client, because I think for a lot of people, when they think about retirement planning and certainly in the financial community, it's usually all about, do I have enough money? What's my number? And am I going to you know, outlive my money? And, and while that's really important, that's not all of what you should be thinking about. And the financial services industry, by and large, traditionally is not thought beyond that. But they're starting to. So every now and then there are some, I would say, typically smaller financial planning service companies that are aligning themselves with retirement coaches or life coaches, and they bring them in. And so the client gets to hear from both of them, and they all talk together. And so they're figuring out a way to get the money side right, but also to get the psychology side right. And and that's a trend that I really am excited about. I, I hope we'll see more of it. That's really terrific. You know, about six months ago or so, I had as a guest on my show a woman who is the, she, she was at Bank of America for many, many years and went back to Bank of America. She went back to school because her why said, I want to learn more about aging. And she became a gerontologist. And she went um, back to Bank of America to head their very first kind of department of gerontology with a focus on, obviously, this demographic. And I thought that was a really nice trend. And she did talk about the psychology of it and what's important to you and making sure, of course, that you had enough money, <laughs> but mm -hmm. to kind of expand your horizons a bit as you're looking at retirement. So I agree with you. I think this is a trend and I, I hope it continues also. So is there anything you want to share with this audience about just retiring in general? Like, what are some of the things you really want to be looking at? How do you know when it's the right time? You have extensive experience in this field. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm lucky that I spent many years writing and editing about that kind of thing. So I've learned a lot from people who knew a lot. But then I don't think anything quite prepares you for actually living it. And so when I I'd been the managing editor of Next Avenue. That's the PBS site for people over 50. I was part of the launch team. I was there for 10 years. And I just decided in 2022, I turned 65. And I felt like it was time to walk away from that job and figure out what I want to do with my time and, and have the time to do other things. And I feel like a lot of people, when they reach that age in their life, give or take, think that that's about what they're looking for too. They want to experiment and try some things. And and for me, and for I think a lot of people, some of that is part-time work, but some of it is volunteering and some of it is mentoring and some of it is spending time with your family and some of it is traveling and some of it is reading and relaxing. You know, it's not the traditional retirement, which was you work full-time and then you work no time and you spend all of your time relaxing, which for many people is great. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but for a lot of us, that's not enough. It's not the and way. So we need, <laughs> yeah, and and so we need something else. But it's it's a little tricky when you're first starting that because you're looking at a blank calendar. You're so used to knowing what your days are going to be like because you're working for somebody else who's told you what your day is going to be like, and these are the meetings you have to go to, and these are the to-do lists assignments you've got to get done. And now suddenly it's all up to you. And so at first it can be a little daunting. Jarring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to you say to yourself, well, how busy do I want to be? And how much should my time do I want to spend working? And, and you start filling in the calendar and you may find that, you know what, I need to fill it in a little bit more, or maybe I'm, I filled it in too much. So don't be afraid to experiment and understand that it will evolve and it, there's no right or wrong answer. And if you try a way of doing it for six months or a year and it's not working out for you, try something else. If you're volunteering at a place and you're not happy with that place or 
for whatever reason is not a good fit, it's okay. Just say, I tried it. Now I'm going to look for some other place. This is a time of life where you really can fail and it's okay to fail. And it's also a time where you can say no, which is something that a lot of us have never been able to do before because we weren't allowed to. Yes, that's a really, really good point. And one thing I really hope that programs like SOAR and others are really incorporating into the program is creating the sense of being fearless. You said the yep. word, don't be afraid, same thing. Be fearless. I mean, when right, you and I, I'm sure can both agree when we think of our own lives and evolution to where we are now, as like if we had been afraid, if you had been afraid to like leave that job and become a, an unretired journalist, then you wouldn't have done it so easily. Right. But you were fearless about it. And I really feel the same way. And it's not easy. It's right. almost a skill that you have to learn. I don't think we pop out being, well, some of us may <laughs> pop yeah. out being fearless. You know, and right. that's a very important, I have found personally, a very important aspect for me of aging is just to continue to be fearless and to continue to be open-minded to trying new things. What, like everything that you've just been discussing. So yeah, thank you for all of that. This was a great conversation. Very, very thank helpful. You. I so appreciate it. As I said earlier, I've been following you for years, Next Avenue, and really all of your unretired journalistic endeavors. <laughs> I will thank have links to a lot of them in the show notes. I, I I'm sure everybody that. will read, of course. And I really do love your podcast. I've learned something new every time I tune in, you and your friends talking about money. Yeah. But before I let you go, Richard, just give us, because we covered so much, just give us like your three most important takeaways you really want this audience to remember. Because as you know, they don't remember everything you say, but they'll remember uh -huh. these moments. So go ahead. Right. What are they? Well, I, I think the first thing is to think about what you want to retire to. What What's going to make you want to get up in the morning and enjoy this chapter of life? I would also say you want to plan that part of life. So a lot of people, all they know is they want to stop working and they don't think at all about what they're going to do next. Before you do that, yes, you want to be sure you can afford to financially stop working full time and maybe all entirely. But you want to think about the rest of life, too, and your psychology and your identity, as well as your financial side. So think about what you want to do. Try some things out and don't be afraid to change course as you go through it, because we're all figuring it out ourselves. <laughs> really such great advice. Thank you so much. I would love to have you come back on again when you've written another right. article, which of course you will, yeah. and to talk about Thank that you. too, because I learned something new from you every time I listen to you or read something you've written. So thank you so Thank much. you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Age Better Podcast, please do a few things. First, share it with all your friends and family. Then subscribe to Age Better wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Finally, if you have ideas for topics you want me to cover in a future episode of Age Better, send an email to agebetterpodcast at gmail.com or reach out to me on social media. Until next time, remember this, we can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.